Okay, we'll get going. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I'd like to introduce you all to Peter Barnett, who's Head of Asia Climate and Energy for Climate Earth. And you can see from the topic um, for Assembly of Western Chairs, this session, Outcomes Focus Climate Engagement, Escalation and International Perspective. Uh, we've done a deliberately broad uh, sweep of uh, what we think are uh, uh, strategies and outcomes that are happening globally. And then we want to bring it a bit more closer the next session when we have Guy Ella from ACC talking about his experience locally. So to start with globally, Peter, over you. Kia ora kato. Uh, I'm pleased to be joining this assembly of investment chairs from Bangkok, if sadly not in the room with, with you all. I'm speaking this afternoon, as was introduced, on corporate engagement on climate change, and in particular, engagement that is focused on concrete engagement outcomes and engagement that considers the full range of investment options or tools. To introduce myself first, I'm uh, a senior lawyer and head of our Asia Climate and Energy Program at Client Earth, which is an international environmental nonprofit. Client Earth is formed of lawyers and we aim to use the law to tackle climate change and protect nature. We do so from uh, eight offices across Europe, in China and in the United States. I focus on the intersection between corporate law and climate change and the role that corporate law can play in driving effective climate action within the private sector. Plant Earth works with governments, companies, investors, uh, and civil society across Asia and globally. Prior to joining Client Earth, I was a corporate disputes lawyer at Russell McVeigh and Wellington, and more recently at a US law firm in London. Climate engagement now forms an established part of stewardship and of climate risk management. It has widespread investor backing, increasing regulatory recognition and heightened urgency as climate impacts are felt around the world. This is a timely subject for this afternoon's discussion coming shortly after the climate COP in Sharm El Sheikh and in a year in which climate impacts have been increasingly felt, felt most heavily by, them, by those who have done the least to contribute to them. Time is running short and we're failing to act at the speed and scale required. Climate engagement as a focus has its critics and in particular critics of so-called uh, tea and biscuits engagement. Engagement for the sake of engagement, lacking a focus on concrete outcomes uh, and lacking seriousness and resolve. So this afternoon, um, we're instead talking about robust and effective engagement. Engagement directed at outcomes that will make concrete progress towards reaching the uh, goals of the Paris Agreement and engagement that considers the full range of engagement options in doing so. The sort of outcomes that we're talking about are illustrated on this slide. Strengthened climate governance, decarbonisation strategy, and short and medium term targets as to how to get there, aligned capital expenditure, just transition and strengthened climate disclosure. Client Earth has now worked for most of the last decade to support that critical role that we see investors playing in addressing climate change. From a legal perspective, that is a role that institutional investors can and must play rooted in the fiduciary duty to manage financially material climate risks. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, this view is supported by legal opinions commissioned by the Aotearoa Circle and authored by Chapman Tripp, considering the duties of managed investment schemes in 2019 and of trustees in 2021. As set out on the slide, Client Earth has also supported institutional investors in using legal engagement tools, in particular shareholder resolutions. Shareholder resolutions uh, concerning a company's governance, disclosure, or business strategy on climate change uh, put to a vote at a company's shareholders meeting. Client Earth supported, for example, the Aiming for A shareholder resolutions filed by institutional investors in the UK in 2015 and 2016, seeking strengthened climate disclosure. 
we've supported the Climate Action 100 Plus shareholder resolution at BP in 2019, uh, requiring a Paris aligned strategy metrics and targets. More recently, we've prepared guides to shareholder resolutions in Europe in 2021 with the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change or IIGCC. Uh, and just this month in Asia, uh, with the AIGCC or the Asia Investor Group on Climate Change. So I thought I would start with a, an, an example of an engagement initiative that will be well known to this audience. And this is Climate Action 100 Plus, now the largest global investor engagement initiative on climate change with growing influence and impact. Climate Action 100 Plus proceeds from that recognition that institutional investors are exposed to climate risks and have a fiduciary duty to respond. Corporate engagement on climate change forms an essential part of that response. CA 100 Plus is formed of 700 investors representing more than 50% of all global assets under management. Uh, six are from New Zealand, BT Funds Management NZ, Devon Funds Management Limited, Kiwi Wealth, Milford Asset Management, the New Zealand Superannuation Fund, and NZ Funds Management. In total, the initiative focuses on 166 focus companies, representing up to 80% of global corporate industrial emissions. The engagement initiative has three asks, which are summarized here and come together in the formation of comprehensive business strategies that fully align with the goals of the Paris Agreement and reach net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. Standing back from this, uh, in, in my view, this represents remarkable clarity and consensus around where investors and beneficiaries' best interests lie. Uh, and the challenge, of course, is how to get there. CA100 Plus has put together a net zero company benchmark, which is made up of the 10 disclosure indicators on the slide. Underneath each of these indicators lie sub indicators, and here some of those engagement outcomes uh, become clear. For example, a target is assessed according to whether it covers at least 95% of scope one and two emissions, and the most relevant scope three emissions where applicable. The sub indicators specifically assess whether these targets are at or below sector trajectories needed to achieve the 1.5 degree Paris Agreement goal. The capital alignment disclosure indicator six considers whether a company has explicitly committed to align its capital expenditure plans with long-term emissions reduction targets and the 1.5 degree Paris Agreement goals. Uh, further sub-indicators assess the company's disclosure of the methodology that it uses and the criteria to assess whether CapEx is indeed aligned, including key performance indicators. So in total, this benchmark provides a useful and fairly comprehensive benchmark for both engagement and also for uh, engagement outcomes, applicable both to the 166 companies within Climate Action 100 Plus, uh, but also much more broadly outside the CA 100 Plus initiative itself. So how are we doing? Uh, first of all, there is some good news. The October 2022 uh, interim benchmark assessment, which is the most recent, found progress on net zero targets with 75% of focus companies now having a 2050 net zero commitment. It also found progress on board oversight on climate change uh, and progress on disclosure. But as set out on the slide, it found that this wasn't yet matched by credible decarbonization strategies. For example, only 20% of focus companies had medium term targets that covered all material scopes, including scope three, and aligned with a 1.5 degree pathway. This dropped to just 10% in relation to short term targets. The assessment found that uh, net zero targets are often not supported by credible decarbonization strategies to deliver them. 
only 51% of focus companies had comprehensive net zero commitments that covered all material scopes, including material scope three emissions. And only 10% of focus companies had committed to fully align their capital expenditure plans with the emission reduction targets or the goals of the Paris Agreement. This lack of progress, sadly, is of course reflected in the fact that uh, greenhouse gas emissions globally continue to rise. According to the IEA's update in March, global energy related CO2 emissions reached their highest ever point last year. This brings us to the question, therefore, of what more can be done uh, to advance these engagement outcomes. And in short, uh, there is plenty more. Depending on the relevant market, uh, there are a broad range of engagement options at shareholders' disposal. And some of them are included on this slide. One option in particular that I'll focus on this afternoon uh, is filing and voting on shareholder resolutions. Insitia, which is a data provider, uh, reports that 146 environmental shareholder resolutions were subject to a vote globally in, 2000 and in, in, in 2022. I won't dwell on this slide, um, but I have highlighted two recent studies that demonstrate the effective role that shareholder resolutions can play in climate and environmental engagement. The first finds that these shareholder proposals measurably increased climate risk disclosure by focus companies and had an associated positive impact on the stock prices. This impact on company disclosure increased uh, when the shareholder proposal was initiated by long-term institutional shareholders. The second, which is by BlackRock Investment Stewardship, uh, finds that a shareholder proposal tends to lead to the companies meeting the request or the ask if it receives significant shareholder support, whether or not it actually passes. For shareholder proposals that received more than 30% shareholder support, 75% resulted in companies fully or partially meeting the relevant ask. And this analysis also confirmed that the proposals on which companies acted addressed material business risks. To assist institutional investors in considering the role that shareholder resolutions can play in constructive and effective engagement, uh, Client Earth alongside the AIGCC recently published the Pictured Guide to Shareholder Climate Resolutions in Asia. This report finds that shareholder climate resolutions can be filed across 11 key jurisdictions in Asia, uh, although the manner and requirements for doing so differ. There was a similar report published in relation to uh, European jurisdictions in the course of last year. So I'll, I'll now turn to three case studies from three jurisdictions in each of Asia, Europe, and the United States to illustrate this range of engagement options. The first is a set of shareholder proposals that was filed by a US $3 trillion investor group at a company called J-Power, which is Japan's largest operator of coal-fired power plants. This marked the first set of institutional investor filed shareholder climate proposals in Japan. And it was a high profile uh, exercise appearing on the front page of the Nikkei as pictured here. The three proposals summarized on the slide illustrate this engagement focus on outcomes. Each proposal focused on a different area of the company's broader decarbonization strategy. And in each case, the proposal received significant support from shareholders. Uh, most significantly, more than a quarter of shareholders supported the first proposal, calling for a business plan and short and medium term targets aligned with the goals of the Paris Agreement. In the course of this engagement, the company announced a new short term emissions reduction targets and subsequently announced a significant renewable energy investment push. The JPower proposals uh, provide an example of institutional investor leadership in drawing on a broad range of engagement options 
uh, in a relatively new market. So the second example is a shareholder resolution filed by another multi-trillion dollar investor group at HBC, uh, a large global bank dual listed in London and Hong Kong. This engagement and the resolution that were filed focused on the bank's provision of fossil fuel uh, assets, starting with coal. The shareholder resolution was filed in, in January 2021. In this case, the engagement continued, uh, and as a result of that engagement, the bank announced in March that it would propose its own resolution on climate change. Uh, this would set out the next phase of its strategy to support its customers on the transition to net zero. The investor group, as a result of this, agreed to withdraw their resolution and support instead the bank proposed resolution. This ultimately passed with more than 99% of shareholders voting in support of the resolution. It was a binding resolution and it required that first the bank set, disclose and implement a strategy with short and medium term targets to align provision of finance across all sectors with Paris goals and timelines. Second, the bank was required to publish and implement a policy to phase out the financing of coal by 2030 in the EU and OECD and 2040 in other markets. And finally, to report annually on progress. This is an example of a highly significant engagement outcome. Uh, and it also demonstrates that shareholder resolutions can complement constructive and positive engagement. Taking this step of filing a shareholder resolution doesn't require uh, and shouldn't be reserved for a breakdown of such engagement. The third and final case study is from the US and illustrates a distinct engagement option, uh, shareholders' ability to nominate board directors. This was something of a David and Goliath battle, where a small impact investment firm, Engine Number no. One, nominated four independent directors to the board of oil major ExxonMobil, which was at one time the US's largest company. This followed a re-energize Exxon shareholder campaign, which argued that Exxon had no credible plan to protect value in an energy transition. This is set out in an impressive investor presentation available on the re-energize Exxon website and linked here. Uh, following a dramatic AGM, three of the four engine number one nominated directors were appointed to the Exxon board. And interestingly, on the very same day, more than 60% of Chevron's shareholders supported a shareholder proposal uh, to substantially reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of the company's energy products, scope three in the medium and long term future. And I would suggest that as investors grapple with the urgency of climate change, this full range of engagement options will become increasingly relevant. So in, in, in closing, I wanted to reiterate three short points. Uh, first, that climate engagement forms an essential and established part of stewardship and investor, investor climate risk management and that opportunities for such engagement exist at a national level, a regional level, and a global level. Second, that robust and effective stewardship should consider the full range of engagement options. These options can contribute to constructive and positive engagement. In many cases, the filing or discussion of a shareholder resolution, for example, can lead to agreed outcomes that allow for the withdrawal of the resolution before a contested vote. And finally, that individual or collaborative engagement can lead to an outsized impact relative to assets under management or shareholding. Uh, smaller funds are often highly nimble as well as sophisticated and lending support to or driving an ambitious company engagement can have a sizable impact in driving outcomes that move us measurably closer uh, to meeting the Paris Agreement goals. We see a role for institutional investors of all sizes and profiles in this area. 
So thank you for your attention during the post-lunch lull, uh, and I look forward to any questions uh, and discussion.